Turn around and you're there. Don't my voice. Talking about uh, going back to your idea of the uh, the chord, um, I've uh, heard or, or, or read theories that that was a kind of uh, cultural tool that allowed people to separate without the fear that they were going to leave the body oh, totally. I see. Yeah. Um, and I I just wonder what other um, uh, is is there a, is the place for using other tools in the outer body to actually do other things? <coughs> you mean like a visual? Yeah, tool? a visual or a, or a feeling or something like that. Whether you can actually create, try and create something. Well, a lot of people that talk about that kind of thing in terms of astral projection and on those kind of levels. Yeah. But I suppose my alignment has always made me interested in looking more for the objective side of it. Um, and and maybe more the, the spiritual thing. I've not so much experimented with changing things and um, uh, yeah, using things like that. But I, I use things like queuing techniques, which um, comes from remote queuing, and that's another thing you can use where you just use like a, a visual symbol or a or a word that's that's basically designed to just take you somewhere in a very specific way. So. So you can anchor yourself back to a location, back back to a, a person or something like that. Yeah, it's it's just um, if you start to think too elaborately and start to like spell out sentences and things like that in a really contrived way when you're in the middle of an OBE, I think it sometimes can just bring you back to your body. So if you can create these concise, more pre more precise um, statements. Um, just short keywords, essentially. It can help you make that kind of thing more effectively, so you can move somewhere more effectively. And so that. That's uh, something that I I've used quite successfully to, to do. So that's the nearest to what you're what you're describing, let's say. <laughs> Sessions. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah, it's it's hard to give you a. Uh, a, a rule of thumb thing with, with the experiences because they can be very different. They can be everything from a few seconds right through to, you know, like, I don't know an hour or something like that is maybe the longest generally that they go. Um, so, and it can have multiple levels to it, and sometimes it can just be one key experience, like just going to that particular location and seeing something and then returning. Um, you know, and that might last 20, 30 minutes, that whole process, um, and that's it, that's all that will happen within that experience, but that might be really, really profound. I think the Soho bombing experience was probably only five, ten minutes, something like that, it's hard to say, but it was still the most powerful experience I've had, I think, and it took me a long time to come out of it as well. The, the other people in the room had kind of draw me out. Lawrence will remember the atmosphere was very oppressive that day, wasn't it? Mm. Um, you, you could sense something. Um, uh, and Chris, another person who was there, he, he had to coax me out of that experience because I was so deeply in it. I, I, I kind of went into this almost black hole kind of thing where I was just in this state and he had to draw me out and you know, bring me back to normal, essentially, so. so do you think you had a premonition about all these sort of time slips somehow? Thoughts on that? a big question, isn't it, really? I, 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 really, I really don't know what happened with that experience. I, I really, I struggle with it on a lot of levels. I mean, I, I spoke at length with Dean Radin about the experience and other scientists about how it could fit in on a scientific level, how time you could see something before it happens and things like that and he talked a lot in terms of quantum potentials and things like that and that is a way that we can understand it in some way but yeah it's uh, there's so many things with this that I think we have to remain in a state of not knowing because I, and I think there's nothing wrong with that I think it's important to be open and to keep exploring and to see see where it goes in a way because there's there's so many possibilities and 
if you close any of those possibilities, you're losing something in a way. You know, it's good to keep exploring and see where it goes. Yeah, I feel like you're really so what I begin to teach as to where could you feel like kind of something to learn from what most of us experience is? I think it's an evolutionary process. I think these are the ease are about shifting to a different level in some way. It's, a, it's an unfolding. I think we've got human consciousness and then if, if consciousness in a way is some kind of awareness of ourself, you know, like self-referring, we're able to be aware that we are us, you know, like I think therefore I am kind of like that. If that is what consciousness is in some sense, I mean that on a very pragmatic level that we, we can identify consciousness as it works in that way. Um, and I think with the out body experience we're going towards some kind of I am the universe and I am aware of that and you know self-aware so cosmic consciousness if you like that's really what that's defined as, as this idea of being on the next level that we're consciously aware of a wider spectrum of things you know because if you think maybe about an animal will have a consciousness and be aware of <coughs> what's going on around it and be aware of pleasure and pain and hungry and you know those kinds of things but maybe not aware of itself in the same way that we are. And I think it, on the next level, it would be to be aware on that sort of cosmic conscious level or global conscious level, you know, or even beyond that, you know. I think that's, for me, that's where the out body experience is heading. That's what I think it's, it's kind of, that's where I feel it's taking me. That's where I feel I'm starting to see more and more and experience more and more. So do you believe in reincarnation as it made you? I think the evidence is very strong. Yeah. I tend to talk in terms of evidence. <laughs> yeah. um, I think the evidence for it is very strong and I think there's a lot of researchers who've shown that. I don't know if that's the only thing that, that's going on and I think possibly if you think about it in terms of fields and interconnected consciousness maybe reincarnation is actually like our minds picking up the mind or the awareness of someone else who's passed over. It might not necessarily mean that there's one you and that that, that you dies and then passes to someone else. It might mean that that <coughs> you goes into a larger stream of awareness and that could come down in lots of yeah. different, yeah. you know. So I, I think you can see it in, in different ways. It doesn't necessarily have to mean it's, a, it's just sort of you jumping from body to body, you know. Yeah. Has your worldview changed? I mean, there's only two things we're certain of in life, and that's birth and death. So the fact that you can separate your being, your physical, your spiritual self from your actual body, does that give you some form of, uh, I don't know, ease at the thought of the future and, you know, where we're all headed? I ultimately? think so. I don't feel like I've got um, much fear of death, I would say. Um, other than maybe suffering and how it how as happen. opposed to the event yeah, itself yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and people generally say I'm pretty calm and, and uh, laid back <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, so it seems um, it's changed me in, in some ways yeah. yeah yeah but it's it's hard for me to say I think that's for other people to judge yeah <laughs> so from your uh, uh, perspective now you know uh, just a quote was that Carl Sagan says that we are a way for the universe to know itself, uh, which I think is pretty really aligned with what you say. Yeah. <coughs> what what um, ambitions do you think that you would have for humanity if you were able to get everybody out of body? Well, I think to if everyone experienced maybe that sense of interconnection and oneness and all of those things that they that, that I've had through the OBE, I think it would be a moving towards a more non-violent, more altruistic, more compassionate, more benevolent, you know, um, more cons just just a, another state on, on the evolutionary line in a way that's not so um, much about violence and dominance and things like that. I think I kind of say that in the end of the first book, there's a, it's called The Philosophy of Benevolence, the final chapter, and it's basically all about that vision of how I see 
the interconnectedness and all those ideas of compassion and whatever leading to a, a greater spiritual philosophy or a spiritual way of life in a way. So I think that's kind of my vision. Um, when that will happen or how that will happen is, is another matter, but I think this is definitely a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. What do you think ultimately could be taught of it to be as if we were going to have bodies or birds and planet or something? You know, I think it's kind of where a step is going eventually to not be in bodies and or restarting somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe, well, maybe our bodies are are the first stage in a way. I think maybe um, maybe physical matter is the first level and maybe it continues on to different levels. Or, um, I don't see anything wrong with physical. I'm definitely not, you know, anti-physical in any way. I think that's all part of it, you know. I don't think that's necessarily better or, or worse. It just gives us more direct access to a, to, to a bigger picture, maybe. Um, so, it's like, is, is uh, a book better or the internet better? It's sort of, you know, it, it, it's in the choice of the book or the cho choice of what you look at. You know, it, it's a lot to do with that, I think. It's a lot to do with how you, the choices you make and how you work with it. So I don't think um, <coughs> on, the, on the bigger picture that you know, that level is necessarily better or worse or than this. I think it's all how we live, how we, you know, how how our integrity functions and you know some people don't have the best integrity with their OBEs and things like that so you know and obviously these these abilities can be used for even for the military and things like that so it's not always in this context but I think if it's used to its full potential this is the kind of potential it's got I think to have that unifying level to it. In your um, book, then, when you go on about travelling above the London streets and you become aware of even inanimate objects having like an energy field around, obviously your vision is fairly good. Mm. When you went to your premonition that the London tube bombings, mm. you were seeing numbers, but you were struggling to focus on, because you had a whole story about trying to find out what date the bombing was. Oh, yeah. Like, is it, was there a difference in vision between your precognition and your normal travel? Oh, there's, there's the vision <coughs> can be all over the place. Right. It can be very different. Um, the one the one you're talking about with the buildings and the signatures, well, that was a, I've had a few like that, but um, yeah, that was almost like I was seeing in in heat signatures. So it was so everything looked auric, if you like, you know, like vivid colours, reds, yellows, greens, blues. You know, when when I use a, when I use slides do lectures I often show one of like a, a thermal imaging camera like images of like the, the buildings with the heat signatures because that's very much how it looked on that on that particular uh, the one I described in the book this um, because it was almost like how the building had accumulated energy so if you think about like people talk about old buildings and hauntings and things like that that they've accumulated some kind of pattern or energy over time. That particular experience was seeing that signature in some way, I think. So normal people seemed, you know, their energy wasn't as strong as this accumulated energy. But then in another experience, I've, all the living things were much more vivid and striking than the, than the buildings and whatever. So, and then in another experience, it will look exactly like this. And then another experience again, it will look exactly like this, but have that blue quality, the blue phase thing, where it's all. Kind of is that the same for everyone? Is it? Um, no, 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 no. Nothing's the same for everyone. Anyone who tells you that, you know. <laughs> no, I mean, everyone sort of have different. Uh, you know, if they travel regularly, do they always have different visual effects? Uh, I can't really talk for other people. I, I think. Um, I think it depends on the depth of the experience. I, I think seeing much in line with this reality is quite common. I think that's probably the most common form. Um, but there isn't one set way that it, that it will work. I think it often depends on the individual and their own alignment to some degree quite a lot. Okay, so how are we doing for time? Ten to six. What was <laughs> that sounds late to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Okay, so is there any last questions? I think it should be the last question. <laughs> well, if you want any books, I've got a few. I've got the first book is Avenues of the Human Spirit, which is more about the spiritual journey and my experiences and things like that. And the second one, Navigating the Outbody Experiences, my practical guide on how to do it. So, oh, and uh, that one's 9.99 and that one's 12. So. <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone wants one, and I'll sign it if you want it. So you do workshops and stuff, do you? I tend to do coaching these yeah. days, which I do via Skype. I do a course. I, I do usually do it over a month and I, um, I use my own sound technology and, but I also create a, a program and something that's specifically for you and then I do it over, over a month one on one and um, via Skype. It's my favourite way of working now because I find workshops are good but you can't really engage with the person as much um, and you can't really find, like I was saying earlier, this thing of what that particular person needs and what their skills are and what they're good at and they're not good at. You know, because if I just go, oh yeah, we're going to do a visualization technique now, and like four people in the room are thinking, oh, I'm terrible at that. You know, that that's the problem with workshops. You know, so yeah, I've moved more towards working in that way with, with the coaching. So. If you're interested, anyone you're interested in that, talk to me and I'll tell you more about it. <laughs>